environmental sustainability alone. It has to be a collaborative effort. That's why the Global Logistics Cluster launched the REC project in collaboration with the IFRC, WFP, Save the Children International and Danish Refugee Council to make sure that uh, we harmonize our practices in environmental sustainability, we disseminate knowledge and we take action in a collaborative and cohesive way to make sure that we're not working in silos, we break down the silos and we really have a col collaborative and collective impact to treat lightly on Earth. So I'm delighted actually to leave the floor to uh, the expert hands of Karolina Kalinowska from the DG ECHO, who is going to moderate this session. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Francesca, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me fine. Uh, I'll first introduce myself. So I'm Karolina Kalinowska, indeed, working at DG Echo. And for the last uh, two and a half years or so, I have been uh, leading on our approach to reducing the environmental footprint of humanitarian aid. And we are uh, very happy supporters of the REC project uh, because, oh, I have to stand up. That's true. Indeed, you can't see me. So we are very happy supporters of the REC project. We really feel that this project uh, will bring about the, the necessary collaboration, cooperation in the logistics sector to uh, support the, um, the greening of it, the reduction of the environmental footprint. And this session today is uh, mainly on data collection, the importance of data collection, methodologies for uh, greenhouse gas emission calculation, because as we know, what we do not measure, we can't manage, or we can't manage what we do not measure. So this is the, the starting point for these discussions. And uh, with that, uh, I, I can introduce our panelists. So Sue Hudson, which you probably all know, the head of uh, humanitarian supply chain at Save the Children. Then next to her is uh, Catherine Vad, perhaps you also know her from ICRC. Uh, she's the environment and climate change advisor. And uh, Virva Tumala, who perhaps you've also worked with. Uh, she's the lead researcher at Humlog uh, Institute um, from the Hankin School of Economics, and she's been supporting uh, some of the research in the in the REC project. So, now, without uh, further ado, uh, let me turn to Sue, who will uh, introduce this uh, this topic. So, as you know, Save the Children is quite advanced in the development of uh, supplier uh, sustainability policy, and uh, utilizes some best practices amongst the humanitarian sector. We have a lot to learn from you. Uh, however, we know that a lot a lot of clauses are also overlooked by local suppliers uh, that we work with and that, uh, that we rely on. So how do you see the monitoring of uh, supplier sustainability in your work and the challenges of the collection of data? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, so just a little bit of background. Save the Children International spent a lot of time developing a sustainability supplier policy, which encompasses the um, economic, social and environmental issues that sit under sustainability. So our approach is we have on average 30,000 suppliers across our 51 countries. So it's a very hefty um, subject matter that we need to deal with. So we've taken an approach with our policy of making it very much about the shoulds and how can we support you to do this. We're not applying a lot of that pressure to say to suppliers, if you don't comply, we're not going to work with you. That isn't realistic. We also appreciate that many of our suppliers are at grassroots level. They are the suppliers in you know South Sudan that are teams deal with all the time um, and very local producers because our, our primary agenda is obviously localization and how can we enhance that. So we've taken an approach of starting small and saying this is our policy, um, there's lots of things you should do, we're going to work with you to understand what does that actually mean. So what does it mean to work with Save the Children? What is it we're actually asking you as a supplier to do? And that's encompassed a lot of training. We're, we're going through this process now of rolling the policy out in selected countries as a pilot and we're having in-depth discussions with each of those suppliers and talking to them about what we expect and what we expect from that. So our first KPI matrix that we'll be looking at is how many of our suppliers are signing up to this new sustainability policy. 
We have mandated it that any new supplier will, as part of its requirement of working with Save the Children, have to comply with that. But again, it's it's not a hard line policy, so it is very much a basic KPI. I just want to point out sustainability is it's a long journey. It's not something we're going to resolve now and tomorrow. We can't turn around to suppliers and say, you will do what we're asking. So we are taking it very slow, a long, nice, slow journey. But as we go along that journey, hopefully we'll bring more and more people with us. And ideally, then, we should start to be able to see and measure the impact of what that introduction is having amongst our countries, country teams. And I'm not isolating here environmental, because if we can drive environmental, there are absolutely positive social and economic impacts that will go with that. So we're looking at it as a holistic sustainability policy, not just as a green sustainability policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. So you spoke indeed about your work with the suppliers, bringing them up to speed training. Uh, definitely could not agree more. But how about the procurement professionals that you are working with, those who are actually also having to deal with the uh, sustainability criteria that uh, SAVE is, is trying to put forward? So in um, earlier this year, we launched our um, sustainability policy. We have 3,000 staff uh, working solely on procurement within Save the Children. That's not including our London team. So everybody has signed up to that. So we have the, all the team have signed up to a pledge to say that they agree with what we're trying to do and that they are prepared to understand and take on uh, what we understand by sustainability. So that was our first point. And that obviously is great to see that our staff are engaging. We've also then, uh, into our bid analysis, we actually have had now for some time, but six months, mandatory environmental uh, criteria inside our bid analysis. So even as we've gone through this process, Process, we've been asking our suppliers to come to us and say, you know, wh what is your policy? Can you provide us, for example, we refuse now to take polystyrene when they're delivering food to the office. We are looking at other ways of working with the supplier. So we're engaging with them and our procurement staff are being brought along with it. So they're engaged. They're coming, we're inviting them to come up with innovative solutions. So it's not all coming from London. We're inviting them and saying, what are you doing? We're very well aware in countries like Rwanda and in Kenya. There is legislation at government level that our country offices can engage with and work directly um, at government level to ensure that we're implying those. So internally, that's been quite good. And we are actually have shared our procurement essentials across the sector. It's on disaster ready. And the plan is that we will also do that with our sustainability policy. So again, back to the point Francesca made, this is not just to save the children. What, because we have the resources, we'll try and develop and share that across the sector so other people can have the benefit of what we've been able to develop. And just a quick follow-up. So have you had to do trainings also for your procurement staff? Uh, yes, we did. We ran them through regions in five languages. And um, we actually ran, uh, to, not so much training on procurement, to, but to make them understand why it's important. Uh, and also to, for them to have a chance to ask questions. That, well, when our suppliers come to us and they can't do this, what's our reply? So we had those, to, not so much training, but more of a, a, a brainstorming and an open discussion group uh, to get them to engage so they can go back to suppliers and engage with them and say this is how we've done it. So it wasn't so much a training, it was more um, bringing them along for the journey because we all know if you're invested in it, then we'll have far more chance of succeeding. Definitely, yes. Couldn't agree more that ownership is, is everything. And we'll come back to you in uh, just a moment. But now moving to the research angle. So the drivers of sustainability practices. In your experience conducting the research under the REC project, uh, what would you say have been um, the effective data collection techniques, the most suitable ones to support with uh, improved sustainability practices? Uh, because we know that often there are also trade-offs between different choices that we need to make, such as waste disposal methods, but also even things we don't really maybe know um, much about in terms of uh, impact or can't do so much about in terms of last mile delivery. So yes, have you come across any good uh, data collection methods to share with us? Thanks, Carolina. Um, I think one of the most important things is to have a comprehensive set of data when you're dealing with, with environmental sustainability. So you can't just limit it to quantitative or qualitative. You really need to have both of those elements there because, well, 
Well, to a lot of people, an Excel sheet full of figures just means nothing and is very detached from reality. So there needs to be that qualitative element there to, to support that and to, to make sure that people really understand what it means. Um, but then also what needs to be uh, really emphasized is is the fact that we need to work with practitioners on the field. So for for that to be um, really inseminable, we need to um, interviews do a lot of interviews and also what. Um, Field research is, of course, one of the, the best ways to get this sort of work done, but that in recent years has been very difficult <laughs> for the unmentionable <laughs> reason. Um, but interviews also with strategic level partners and uh, with organizations working in places like Geneva and New York, those really need to be uh, taken into consideration as well. So I think mo the REC project that we did, or the, the part that I was in, we did uh, through interviews, through teams, unfortunately, because we were unable to travel. So um, that really did bring great insight. And then we also did some focus groups and workshops where we had lots of people from different organizations present, uh, which was also very, very valuable. So I think um, these types of um, communal events like workshops and focus groups really do um, lend value as well to this type of thing. But um, as I'm more of a qualitative researcher myself, I like to toot that horn, but um, you really can't um, underestimate the value of having quantitative data to go with that. So that, I believe, is the next step in the REC project, that we've done the quantita qualitative baseline, we've looked at the research, we've looked at papers, we've looked at academic research, we've looked at practitioner um, data, and then we've done the empirical interviews. So now it's time to take that baseline and go uh, move into a more quantitative approach. So I think the comprehensiveness of having both of those angles supporting each other, I think, is the, the core here. Definitely, indeed, because in environmental sustainability, actually a lot can be hidden behind numbers. Uh, we may have certain assumptions, but then when we actually crunch the numbers or do a life cycle assessment, we realize that our assumptions may not have actually been correct. So definitely the, the next step would be the quantitative. However, at the same time, it may also be overwhelming to humanitarians to have uh, so much information uh, that, that then might lead to inaction if we are overwhelmed by, by the amount, but it's not really true translated into, into concrete um, actions or, or change in behavior. Do you have any recommendations to give on, on that front uh, for humanitarians to reduce our environmental impact while also working with, uh, with data? Well, I think the old sort of adage of think globally, act locally works quite well here. So knowing your context and what is required there, knowing what the what the infrastructure is like, knowing the policies of, of waste management, for example, within that context is super important because there is no one-size-fits-all solution to this as we've already established. Um, but there are some universal sort of tips and tricks that can be utilized as long as you know the context where you are working. And again, I'd like to highlight the the value of research with practitioners and the data collected alongside practitioners. So, because um, as you said, when you, there's a lot that can be hidden behind numbers and data, so you know we might establish that this is a great way of doing things, but then when you take it into the field or a refugee camp context, for example, we find out that it just does not work. So, um, the practitioner collaboration, context, knowledge, all of this, I think, is something that. Um, will help inseminate the data that then researchers come up with. And again, just forming it in a way, don't hand people an academic paper to read when, when we're trying to, to, to disseminate best practices, but you know, dress it up in a way that people can actually understand it. 
Definitely, I think that will be the next uh, challenge also for the REC project, is translating <laughs> all that information into, into usable um, tools that, that uh, are, yeah, are simple and, and straightforward for us. So now, um, moving to Katrin, who has uh, a lot of experience with ICRC, but also even before that, with uh, developing uh, carbon reduction roadmaps, with calculating greenhouse gas uh, emissions. How does one go about actually starting this journey in a humanitarian organization? And what recommendations might you have or, or tips for smaller organizations that may not have the resources that ICRC does? Thank you, Carolina. Um, I think it's very important when you start out to really keep your objective in mind, but also to determine what your constraints are as an organization. Um, so when I think about objectives and carbon accounting, it's actually not about getting that final number in the end, because that one can be quite difficult to even understand. You know, what does it represent, a thousand tons of CO2 emissions? Um, but it's much more about you wanting to learn where what are the bigger contributors to your carbon footprint so don't get overwhelmed or, or or get tied up into finding the exact right number that you're looking for but rather keep in mind the big picture use the data that you have start small start on a subset of your organization or a subset of all potential um, carbon emissions and really look into keep that objective in mind of determining I want to know where I should be spending the effort because it's all about acting in the end. It's not about that, that final number. Um, learn from what other humanitarian organizations have done. There's quite a few now that have actually done comprehensive carbon accounting exercises. Um, I think back to some uh, what some of my colleagues have said. Um, it's, the results are often not intuitive. If I take the example of the ICRC, 60% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the food, the relief items, and the construction materials that we use in our um, in our interventions. It's not about our travel. That's five or six percent every year. Um, it's actually not about transporting the products, but it's about how they're produced. So it's not intuitive. So keep that in mind as you select subs and you select specific categories of emissions to, uh, to, to look at. Um, if you don't have the physical data, if you don't know how many kilograms of rice are you buying every year or how many tons of cement, use um, financial data. For a first estimate, it's actually good enough. Our first estimate of carbon emissions, we did it back in 2017, only using financial data. And the conclusions about the bigger um, areas of impacts were the same as what they are today when we have um, more physical um, data to be used. Um, just don't, I think, just keep in mind that you're doing this in order to put action in place to reduce your footprint. So don't get stopped by data and calculations and methodologies, but always keep the, the, the eye towards the end. Um, I take this opportunity to also just highlight to everyone that under the umbrella of the Sustainable Supply Chain Alliance um, program, the ICRC together with the IFRC and a number of national societies has actually developed a carbon accounting tool that will be released next month. It's going to be available to all humanitarian organizations who wish to get started and it's going to come together with a number of advice about what are the important emission categories for humanitarian actors, how do you get started, um, what do you do when it's the second time that you do a carbon um, um, emission calculation, etc. So also just to flag that tools are becoming available um, for humanitarian organizations as we go forward. Definitely. Thanks so much for mentioning indeed the, the carbon accounting tool and congratulations to, to ICRC for leading on that effort. It's been a very collaborative, collective effort uh, and I think the outcome is, is very solid. So if you haven't heard of it yet, definitely do look into it. You mentioned the financial data. Thank you so much. That was actually going to be my question about the encountering challenges of, with collecting data because we know that um, other organizations that may have done that, you know, they have relied on 
down actually their field offices, people on the ground to, to collect that. Uh, but it's good to hear that the financial data at the beginning at least is a good estimate. So it should not be a hindrance if you do not have a system in place yet to really get the raw data. But I am curious to hear if you had any challenges with actually the raw data collection from, from colleagues and how did you overcome that? Um, so one of the challenges that we impose or constraints that we impose on ourselves when we set out to develop our own carbon accounting tool was actually not to ask colleagues to dig for more data. So that was a clear um, parameter in, in our first project um, and it still is. Um, so we are actually... Um, I guess our constraints are more on how do we improve and push forward the databases that we use today for the um, collection of the input data to be able to get the data that we need. So an example is in our, in our transport, in our freight. We don't have one single database in the ICRC that, that shows us all the, the commercial freight that we use. So today we're, for example, collecting information from about eight delegations that we think represent roughly 80% of the freight activity in the ICRC and we use that to project what 100% of our freight activity would be. So we're trying to put some of these pragmatic steps in place but then continuously working with the transport teams to see when and what kind of system could we be implementing in, uh, ultimately to get the data for anyone that actually um, buys commercial freight in, uh, in our organization. Thanks so much. Yes, some very good advice, I think, there. Uh, so we all work with the private sector in one way or another uh, as logisticians, as humanitarians. Can we learn from the private sector in this endeavor? Is there anything that uh, is transferable that we can take on? I, I actually think there's a lot that's transferable. I, uh, I used to be a consultant uh, before I joined the ICRC five years ago, working on industrial sites. So I, I firmly believe that a lot can be transferred. Um, there's obviously a lot of the technical solutions out there that, that, that we can absorb as, as humanitarians and that are becoming more and more easy to adapt to our context. But beyond that, um, there's also some of the internal processes that private sector uh, companies use to drive sustainability that I think we can we can transfer and, and adapt to, to the humanitarian context. I'm thinking here about things like environmental management systems, the, the ISO plan, do, check, act, and what that means for, for a humanitarian um, organization. I'm thinking about systems like carbon pricing that um, organizations use to actually make sure that these aspects and of environmental sustainability are taken into account whenever there's a decision made by the organization at every level of the organization. And I think beyond the technical solutions, that's where we can really learn a lot because the, I mean, for the good or bad, the private sector has been pushed into taking action on environmental sustainability for a longer time than, than the humanitarian sector. Um, and then I think there's a, a logic that many of us already are trying to, to learn from. Um, in the ICRC, I'm, I'm currently trying to develop our carbon uh, decarbonization roadmap, and I'm doing a, a, a lot of consultations when, with teams in the organization. And I'm hearing amazing projects from, for example, our uh, livelihood teams um, that are looking into how to use the market to create and diversify livelihoods in the field. And that helps us decarbonize, but it's also about building resilience in the communities where we work. So, example, of how to use waste as a livelihood opportunity, um, how to do market analysis so that we can actually have the proper interventions with farmers to decrease some of the cost of, 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 of farming by making products available to them in a different way. So I think that we also have a lot to learn there on within that logic of the, the, the private sector. 
Thanks so much. Indeed, uh, you touched upon the, um, the issue of uh, the local supply chains. This wasn't part of the, um, the planned panel, let's say, but I think it's a very interesting debate because it also goes back to the issue of data. Because um, we say that you know, by buying locally, then we are also green by default because we avoid the international transport. We know from cases like ICRC who've done uh, you know, up until the scope three emissions that that's not always the case. Unless, of course, you are supporting the local uh, actors to be more environmentally sustainable. And I think this can also be a role for us to play to work when we work with the local suppliers to also ensure that they are meeting the environmental criteria so that we're not accidentally moving the, the impact uh, you know, elsewhere to the local environment, just we, are, we do not see it um, because we are yeah, more focused on just the act of procuring. Uh, so I think that's very interesting and this also uh, makes me think that maybe as organizations we should also be more open in our procurement rules to also accept uh, such items. Uh, we had a very interesting case uh, just a few weeks ago um, of an initiative where um, refugees and host communities together were using waste produced in the camp to actually produce uh, new items. And we've seen these cases, so this was a case from, from Kenya, but we know the same thing is happening in, uh, in Western Sahara. But the products they are uh, producing could actually be the products that then humanitarian organizations purchase anyway and distribute. They were not. They were more, uh, let's say, general items for the, for the, the local market there. But we could think of it the other way to see would our procurement rules allow the supporting of such initiatives, such circular uh, initiatives where the waste we generate is actually goes back to then um, produce the items that we in any case purchase. So yeah, just some food for thought there. Uh, but now opening up back to the panel, um, Sue has been very patient <laughs> with listening to the other uh, colleagues, but um, over to all of you. Do you have, uh, what are your thoughts on the synergies that are needed to uh, us to build cost-efficient, sustainable practices? So you represent uh, the academia, um, humanitarian organizations, but we also talked about the private sector. What are the synergies to encourage more sustainable procurement? such a really interesting question and I, I just want to hop back to the point you made about uh, it's a key synergy about um, the practice you've just seen about how they can use waste materials supply chain provides inputs as, as, a, as a business partner to its to other areas such as the thematic sectors so we, all, we can't just do this on our own so key synergy has got to be if we're buying we can buy environmentally friendly products whether it's local or not but if our thematic teams and our countries don't actually think about how they're changing the, the projects that they run in the field and what that means at field level. It's very difficult for us to just be able to do sustainability as a supply chain. So one of the key synergies has got to be not about supply chain changing its attitude, as a sector from the, the, all the way across the sectors in the thematics as well, have got to engage with us and say, well, what does that look like? What does that mean? Um, and ultimately, as you're coming from a donor perspective, let's not pretend that being environmentally friendly and taking that approach is going to be any cheaper and that of course has to be reflected when we're talking in our proposals with our donors so at a high level I think there's a key synergy there that supply chain cannot do this on its own that we had there has to be an engagement across the whole sector and a drive across the whole sector to allow us to be able to look at environmental practices in general Definitely. Thanks so much. And indeed, yes, on the cooperation with, with donors, I think this is key to continue the dialogue on what are the actual added costs. I think that's a, a bit of a, well, not a mystery, but it is something that we need to also know. What is the actual financial impact for you for moving into uh, these practices over others? So definitely, uh, thanks for that. River, Catherine? If I can rebound on what you said, because I think we're very aligned on, on, on that point. Um, 
there is a need for that alignment to happen. I think that there is a need for us to also agree on what do we mean by sustainability in the supply chain. If we are all able to push suppliers towards the same, in the same direction, I think that that's much more powerful than the ICRC asking its supplier to be greener. Um, but we need to understand what are we putting behind being greener or being more sustainable so that we know in what direction we should all be pushing. So it does ask for indeed more alignment also in, 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 in the definition, more transparency with whom are we working, what are we buying, what are the products requirements that we're setting, what are the criteria in our selection table that we're using, very practical things. Um, and then of course being able to, to share um, a lot of what, what we're doing. And um, the ICRC has been um, hosting a, a sort of informal working group on quality, social and environmental assessments of suppliers for a number of years, where we share with many organizations, or where actually not we, but organizations, uh, all of them share with everyone what we are doing. Um, but one of the, 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 the sort of barrier, key barrier that we see is that legally it's very difficult to share an assessment or an audit of a supplier with an order organization. So we will need to overcome some of these very practical barriers to make sure that we can actually collaborate and share and make maybe one audit of one supplier for all and that will be more cost effective in, in, in the end. Definitely, and I think the ICRC also uh, offers that in a way to, to other uh, organizations, if I understand correctly, these checks that, uh, that you are doing. How has that gone? I mean, as, as I said, I think we do that informally. I don't think we have the formal setting uh, um, yet. Uh, and, and we do that on a, on a small subset of our relief items as well, to be, to be very honest with you. So there's a huge work required to sort of replicate that at scale um, for EHIs, for building materials, for food. And each category sort of also requires its, its own approach. Um, so so, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure it's helping, but I'm sure that we have a lot to learn from others that have probably worked a bit more in, in different categories. And, and just to add to that, um, because we have then talked about a lot about the humanitarian sector, another key synergy which we don't always talk enough about is how we can do business with our commercial partners. So the commercial, in certain areas, especially around freight, you know, the commercial businesses are way ahead of us. Why am I still using my own freight when I've got some of the biggest freight haulier companies in the world around? So I think we've got to build that and learn from them and stop doing things ourselves where it's much more cost efficient to actually engage with a, a business partner, commercial business partner, and learn from them, who are already measuring CO2 emissions from shipments. All of our suppliers can give me that data. So that then adds into the tools that you're saying you're then able to measure. By doing that, are you actually supporting and reducing carbon emissions? So I don't want to lose in this conversation the necessity to engage with commercial partners as well. Definitely, yes. Thanks so much. Viva, did you want to add? Uh, yeah, just to um, piggyback off of what Sue said about the commercial sector is that if you, from a research perspective, if you type in sustainable supply chain management, you will get thousands upon thousands of hits because they, the research in that area has been going on for decades already. But if you add humanitarian to that, you get very few results. So um, I think Sue is absolutely right that there is so much value in collaboration collaborating with the commercial sector, with private sector partners, both globally and locally, uh, to improve the environmental sustainability within hum the humanitarian context. Um, and sort of as an outsider <laughs> looking in from the academic perspective, um, we as researchers, we have this, like, we are one of the people who have an umbrella view of the whole or we are able to have the, an umbrella view of the whole sort of process. So, of course, organizations have that perspective that they are sort of given within the context that they work in, but we are able to maybe look at the, the whole in a different way, and we can see it um, 
you know, from the local to all the way back to the main office in Geneva or New York. So I think researchers really, you know, I want to have a job in the future as well. So I think researchers definitely should play a large role in this in this um, sort of transition towards environmental practices. And I think researchers can be a very useful tool because we have so much information available to us already. Thanks so much, uh, all the colleagues. So you have a very um, experienced panel, as you can tell here, a very pragmatic panel. So now the opportunity for you to ask any questions that you may have on their experiences, something you were you were wondering. Uh, the floor is open, and I'll pass the mic to you too. Thank you so much, Carolina and colleagues. And actually, it's really beautiful to see what collaboration means, to see academic partners and international organizations and funders, uh, uh, all donors coming together, trying to tackle the main issues uh, linked to humanitarian aid and sustainability. So actually, we would be interested in knowing if anybody in the audience has any questions for the panel. Yes, please. So, hi everybody, I'm Fiona Cook, I'm a consultant working on environmental sustainability, among other things, um, and I'm currently on a project uh, funded by USAID, which works on uh, reducing packaging waste, um, both upstream and downstream, and also consulting for Norwegian Refugee Council on integrating environmental sustainability into the logistics. Sorry about the long intro. Um, I guess one of the questions which comes up a lot um, with our partners and stakeholders is the added cost of environmental sustainability and carbon action. And I thought maybe the panel could have a, a few words. You know, what we tend to tell people is actually that it can have long-term savings, uh, but there might be increased costs up front. And I believe that the donor community is also starting to sort of ad acknowledge this uh, uh, potential barrier and uh, <clears throat> ECHO, for example, in the, their recent guidelines on the minimum requirements have mentioned uh, this possibility of 10% extra funding for environmental sustainability, basically so that projects integrating environmental sustainability are not penalized for being more expensive. So yeah, just some pearls of wisdom maybe you could share with us on that. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the donor issue because in the interviews that I did for the REC, REC project, there was often a sort of chicken or egg situation with the donor thing that the practitioners were saying that, oh, um, we don't have enough money to get to be more environmentally sustainable because in the short term it can be more expensive. But then the donors I interviewed were saying that nobody asks for money <laughs> to be more environmentally sustainable. So um, that is definitely a synergy that needs to be focused on more with the, with, um, the donor, maybe some of the sort of requirements that they may have for the for the um, practitioners and for the projects. And um, yeah, I think you also mentioned about the long-term savings. Those have, in sustainable supply chain management literature, those have been quite widely discussed as well, and they do exist, <laughs> the long-term savings. So I think um, a more long-term thinking is something that is needed at the moment. I don't know if you agree. <laughs> No, definitely. Um, I think there's, there's long-term savings. There can be short-term savings as well. Uh, I mean, the obvious example here is uh, let's fly less and that will save you some money. But but we also have cases where, um, I mean, a while ago the ICRC redesigned actually the, the packaging of its kitchen set. So we took out all of the individual plastic bags that were protecting each individual item in the kitchen set. We shortened the knife and the fork for technical reasons to make them fit into a smaller box. And we did that in collaboration with the supplier of, of a kitchen set. And in the end, we got the kitchen set for a cheaper price than what was the beginning price. So there can be, in these cases, short-term savings as well. Um, but of course, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. There will be products that will be um, more expensive. The ICRC is working with um, an organization that's called the Climate Action Accelerator on our road 
roadmap. We are investigating how much this decarbonization roadmap will cost. So in a few months, I hope that I could actually give you an actual figure for, for our organization. But what I can say from the CAA's perspective is that they've worked with Alima and they've worked with a number of operational centers of MSF. And the decarbonization overall isn't costing them very much money. It's just that we see shifts between savings and investments needed. So it's about rebalancing our budgets, but overall it's a relatively balanced um, approach. Um, just to take a slightly different stand on that, and I'm part of the same project looking at waste management, Save the Children's in that working group. We took an approach of not necessarily looking at the waste at the end. We've taken the approach of let's deal with the waste at the start by talking to our suppliers about having sustainable packaging or whatever that looks like at the start of the procurement process, not dealing with it downstream. So by doing that, it goes back to the same about sustainability policies. It's also working about what we will accept or what we want to except from our suppliers and what can they offer us as a different opportunity. Because we we are a little bit easier than some NGOs because we run a, a purchase to pay system so we can actually pull out data on our entire supply chain of what that looks like. Um, I'd also want to push here as well, and I often get told this about, but what happens in emergencies, you know, the, how's environmental work? If we are better at planning and looking at our sourcing and our demand in advance, then back to the point my colleague was making you can balance out the additional costs. If we constantly buy things short, a, a very reactive basis and we ship them around the world, if we as organizations can have a better understanding on our demand, our future demand and rolling six months demand plans, we it puts us in a much better position to negotiate value with our suppliers. And again, that brings those cost differences back down. So it's a combination, I think, of lots of things that can balance the books at the end of the day. Thank you so much for your interventions and thank you for the relevant question. I think that we might have time for another question. Maybe another two if they're quick. Okay, please. Hello, my name is Fredrik Fresell and I work for the Swedish development agency, SIDA. So I think the question about, from, about donors is interesting and also the fact that you mentioned that donors, uh, no one has sort of asked them for extra funding. So what could donors do better? Uh, um, do you need more sticks or carrots, or, or are there any good examples? Uh, I don't know, maybe Echo has been more proactive than, than we have been. Thank you. Um, well, I think um, Fiona mentioned the DG Echo's humanitarian logistics policy, which now includes um, a greening part in it, and it has definite, uh, that's a definite step forward in this regard, that um, a major donor such as Echo is taking the stand, and, well, for one thing that they have, a humanitarian logistics policy is already a great thing, um, but just that it includes a greening bit in it as well is also a really great step forward. Yeah, just to add to that, with um, the, the comments on that process, and I think it, it's a great step forward, but it is, we're still in the basis, basics of this, and it is still very vague. It's still not clear what exactly that the donor is expecting us to deliver. You know, we all work in a world of deliverables and KPIs, but it, it, the policy's there, and it's a great start, and we're all driving towards it. We all know what's wanted, but we're not really clear on what does the what is the outcome of this? What are we going to measure it by, and what specifically does the donor want? And for us, I think that's the key bit missing. It's not, it's not clear what the tangible outputs are that the donors ask us to produce. When you say we want you to be greener, what does that mean? <laughs> And there's an, there's an, just to add to what you were saying, uh, both of you, there, there's a dimension as well about whether it's at the project level that you're talking about needing additional funding or whether it's actually at the higher institutional level. Um, there's obviously a lot of things that can be done within a, a specific humanitarian intervention to green it, but if you really want to have an impact, um, you know, changing a, a diesel generator for solar panel in one project is great, but actually what would be better is to 
have a policy in the first place that says from now on we will invest in solar panels and we have to justify why we buy diesel generators. So the, 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 the issue about asking for money might also be that sometimes we feel it's easier to ask for project level money when it's actually institutional level projects that we would need to drive in the first place. Definitely, yes. Thanks, Catherine, for bringing in the organizational level dimension. Definitely, um, in terms of what ECHO is doing now, we are looking at the projects because we work on a project basis, but we also work with through certification of our partners, and I would say that's the next step. We didn't take it now because our approach is a phased approach, stepwise approach. We want to do this together with the whole humanitarian sector, so we've started with the project level, but I think, I mean, we've made this clear in our, in our approach that we published in 2020 that the full ambition, let's say, would be to ask for environmental management systems at the organizational level. So essentially, if you want to be an ECHO partner, then you would have to have something like that in place. And I think the, um, the fact that the Climate and Environment Charter uh, has also uh, been uh, spearheaded by ICRC and IFRC at the same time, which requires signatories to develop action plans, targets, and, and road maps is a good bridge for that so maybe we could see, you know look into in the future as a means of let's say ticking that box would be to be a signatory and have that uh, that roadmap in place but I couldn't agree more that the project level is is the small scale but the change is really at the organizational level and actually the two go hand in hand especially for logisticians I would say because if you want to make the change at the project level you actually have to rethink what you're doing really at the at the organizational level level. So maybe well, just one more question. Thank you, Francesca. My name is Juan Galvez. I work at the, at the FRC. I'm, I'm really pleased to, to, to be here and, and hear about what you are sharing. I think, Carolina, you have been mentioning about um, suppliers and one of the myths that maybe local suppliers can get kind of greener or can be as, as greener. We have been talking as well about how to get uh, things from the private sector. So I think the GHG protocol that we are all using, I think it's one of the examples. It was developed uh, mainly via the, the private sector. I'm, I'm thinking about yeah, which are those differences and I'm thinking maybe more on the cash-based interventions and kind of the second myth. Uh, are cash-based interventions kind of greener than in-kind uh, supply chain that we have been doing for, for years and kind of linking a little bit with academia and maybe trying to also keep your job, how we can try to get more, more data on, on that front. Um, I think maybe the kind of waste at the end is the second area that is a little bit difficult uh, to, to measure, but focusing only on the cash-based interventions, uh, which is your, your thinking about it. Um, thanks, Juan, for the question. You already know my answer, I think, but <laughs> for everybody else, <laughs> I... Um I'm a strong believer in the fact that cash is not greener than in-kind um, interventions. It doesn't mean that it's worse either. It's basically today, I think we do not know what the environmental impact of cash is because we do not know what people are buying with this cash, but whatever they're buying, that also comes with a carbon load. So it's very difficult to, to compare. Um, in the ICRC's environmental, uh, sorry, carbon accounting tool, we do do calculate cash because we did not want to leave out of the calculation an increasing part of our humanitarian intervention. But at the time when we developed the tool, so that was um, back in 2019, 2020, there was no methodology for calculating cash. So we sort of invented our own, which is what it is. I believe it's underestimating the impact of cash, um, but very important that we do more research into that that aspect. The positive maybe side of cash is that I also think cash can be used to drive good um, either environmental um, behaviors but also just drive environmental actions in communities, reforestation, soil stabilization work, etc. So cash has a really a potential to bring in positive local environmental impact as well if we know how to deal with it correctly. So it goes beyond just carbon accounting but also thinking how do we integrate 
that sustainability angle when we make the decision to go for cash or for in-kind. It's not the only criteria, but we need to integrate it as yet another criteria in our decision making. If I can just add to that as well, uh, going back to the point I made at the top, but the point is we're talking about sustainability here. Sustainability is an umbrella, and under that fits social, economic, and environmental. They don't sit as separate pillars under that. So even though it might not be sustainable, as you're saying, from a procurement point of view, that doesn't matter because there are added or perhaps enhanced benefits on the social and economic scale. So it's not one or the other. It's trying to find a solution that cuts across all of sustainability to work, uh, to work with people to, to the best way forward. And when you're talking about regeneration of farmlands, that's a massive environmental impact. Um, and, and how does that, is that offset because they suddenly decide to buy a plastic toy for their son uh, two, two weeks down the line? So it's thinking about the whole sustainability angle and um, not just one pillar. And I just want to make one push before we finish today that I think all of us, because we've had these discussions before, that... We don't want to drive sustainability as something we do. We want to drive sustainability as it's part of our DNA. It becomes cultural in what we do. We don't think about say, oh, we need to take the box on sustainability. We need, as a community, need to start thinking about that. This sits like safeguarding does. It sits under everything we do. And when you're thinking through these projects, we should be automatically thinking about, is there an impact to that? Or can I make a, a, a positive impact? So I just want to also add, as we're having these discussions, that please start to think about this as being part of your DNA and not an add-on to something that we have to do because we're being pushed to do it. Um, yeah, Get just a soapbox now. <laughs> Um, I'd like to agree with you on the soapbox about sustainability being a holistic whole rather than the pillars. And cash has that sense of dignity that it brings to the beneficiaries that then, and then the added social and economic um, uh, elements that it brings to the national, uh, local economies, etc. Um, there was another point that you made too that I wanted to jump onto, but I forgot. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I think the whole context dependency thing is very much um, emphasized with cash as well. So you really have to know, or like you have to be quite aware of what the context is. If the whole private sector is destroyed, that there's no point in handing out cash. But if there is a functioning market, of course, cash would be one solution that works well. So um, yeah, holisticness and social uh, context dependency are my main answers for everything, pretty much, I guess. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. I would just quickly like to add on the on the cash question because uh, for ECHO, um, obviously our main policy is uh, cash first and basically we ask our partners to tell us why not cash. But within the environmental um, approach, we also wanted to draw the attention that cash is not an answer to, to everything. So now we have a requirement and this is the basic requirement as to integrate environmental risk into the risk uh, analysis that cash actors have to do anyway. So they look at various risks when assessing uh, cash and then environment should be there. Ideally then informing of course the, the response, the choice of modality, maybe a combination of modalities, but at least starting with the awareness of the risk. Uh, and I think that goes as well back to the collection of, of data really. You look at the, at the markets, you see what's out there. Um, if I'm allowed to wrap up now, I think we are uh, to time. And actually, there's another relevant event just after this that I will plug. So hopefully, you can all make it on time. Uh, but thank you so much for this full uh, full room, or um, room without walls. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, the need for accurate data, the combination of qualitative, but also the importance of quantitative data. But at the same time, the, uh, let's say, um, soundness of working with financial data if you don't have the, the raw data from your uh, field teams or, or operations. You can estimate quite well your greenhouse gas emissions from financial data using, uh, of course, um, the, the indicators to translate what, what are the actual um, uh, yeah, carbon footprints uh, of the purchases. Uh, we talked also about the, the long-term financial savings that can be had uh, from this, which might not be visible at the beginning, but 
when we talk about the more uh, yes long term uh, view and I think this is something that we as humanitarians should start doing we are not used to it but we should start doing because unfortunately the context where we work in uh, will continue to, to to be there so in many contexts we can actually afford let's say to have this long term thinking and echo is trying also to play a part in that with the multi-year funding that we're trying to to move towards to encourage not in every context it will be possible of course but but in many yes and then um, it's really about rethinking how we how we do and, and sue talked about the importance of working with the with the thematic teams of course uh, you will not be able to do everything on your own uh, but also the commercial actors that uh, can bring a lot to to the table uh, we need more information on the environmental impacts of cash uh, I think this is a big uh, big area for for all of us to work on together and then finally that environmental sustainability is not an add-on it is really uh, something that that should now be uh, let's say in our DNA and a, and a through line uh, through our actions and on that uh, there is an event at the Danish pavilion on sustainable procurement it's a high-level panel so you may ch decide whether or not you want to listen to high-level speakers uh, but there is an exchange uh, on that with uh, actually our director general there and uh, other very interesting speakers so I think it's that way and on that note I hand over to Francesca thank you so much Thank you, thank you. Actually, just to wrap up, wrap up, we just wanted to thank you, uh, everyone, in, on behalf of the Global Logistics Cluster, thank all the colleagues which are working on the REC project, and uh, in case you want any more information about the project itself, I'm going to distribute some brochures afterwards, so we're not keeping you from lunch, so please enjoy your break, and thank you so much for being with us today.